I have these uh, extraordinary memories of of just sweet things and kind things that people have done for me uh, over the years. And uh, I, it's difficult even if I try to forget those things, I can't. But uh, just remembering sweet things that people have done for me. Uh, probably my, my great, greatest memory is when my wife said yes uh, to, to marry me. That's one of my better memories. We all have memories though, right, of, of uh, special things that people have done for us. And we sometimes like to be nostalgic about it and think back about, you know, that moment, that day. Uh, we were having dinner last night uh, celebrating Ada Kyle's birthday, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kyle and his family. And uh, we just, in the course of conversation, uh, Dana started, uh, was asked about our marriage. And she started just sharing uh, about how we got together, how we found each other. It's, it's good to remember uh, good things. All of you this morning, I, I know, have those stories, right, of maybe uh, a moment that your, your dad was kind to you or maybe that your mom did something very special for you that was unexpected, uh, maybe an uncle, uh, maybe a good friend. And it's, it's good to pause just for a moment and remember um, what, those, what has been done for us. Um, come and listen, David Crowder, what an amazing song. Um, come and listen to what God has done for us. When we come together and we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, we call it, some people call it communion, uh, we're remembering uh, the extraordinary uh, act of selflessness uh, that uh, Jesus did on our behalf. We're remembering that moment uh, for us. Uh, if you have not experienced his love in this, in this way, then obviously you can't remember <laughs> what he's done for you. But this, is, this celebration of, of what Christ has done, remembering what he's done for us is, is important. And we are asked by uh, our Savior himself that we do this to remember what he's done for us. Uh, what he's done for us that we could not do for ourselves. Uh, it's only something that he could do for us. Dying on the cross, being a perfect sacrifice for the sin that needed to be paid for. Jesus was killed on a cross. He died. And because he's God, he was able to overcome death and rise again. And so we celebrate his resurrection as we take this. But there is a sacrifice, a tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me. And we are asked by our Lord and Savior to remember that. The Bible, uh, ironically, doesn't say, you know, a, an overload of information about the Lord's Supper, which is fascinating. It's interesting. Uh, we see this recorded uh, that Jesus set with his disciples, the, those, those few that he had selected to be apostles. Uh, he sat with them before uh, he was crucified and he said to, that, telling them, my body's about to be broken for you. And he said, so he, he took bread, he broke it, and he asked them to, to eat the bread in remembrance of the sacrifice that he was about to make. And then he took uh, the cup and, uh, and they drank together uh, the cup, uh, remembering the blood that was about to be spilled out on the cross. The blood, which was uh, the, the, the promise that uh, Jesus' blood was sufficient enough for us, that blood was spilled in order to pay for the sins that were coming, the sins of humanity and the sins of humanity that were coming. Your sins, my sins, paid for because the blood of Jesus was spilled. And so we beat the bread and we drink, in our case, juice. <laughs> some, some churches do wine, but we take this liquid uh, to remember that the blood of Christ was actually spilled. There's, uh, although this is recorded in, in the Gospels, you know, those, the letters of, you know, uh, uh, of the apostles, a recording of Jesus sitting down, the only other time this is mentioned is as a warning. Uh, we see this in 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, those Corinthians, uh, whenever, whenever I read this, I think about those people. They were always doing things improperly, and yet they're still children of God. It's, it's from the letters to Corinth that we get the most information about perversion and how to deal with perversion in our society today and how to, to not do things like they did. 
you know, it was so Paul wrote them and says, you know, I cannot believe the things I'm hearing about you, dot, dot, dot. And then he would fill in the blanks about horrible things they were doing and they should stop doing. He writes uh, to the, uh, uh, the Corinthians and explains how the Lord's Supper should be done and how it should not be done. First Corinthians makes it very clear that the Lord's Supper is primarily about four things, all right? I think this morning we are smart enough and awake enough to remember four things. Are you with me? Are we tracking? I know some of you have not had coffee yet, but we're going to try to do four points this morning. Praise the Lord, all right? The Lord's Supper is about, number one, you with me? It's about family. It's about family. Uh, it's about communion. These will not pop on the screen yet, but the verse is coming. It's coming. So four things. It's about family. It's about remembering, right? It's about remembering what Christ has done. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And it's also about the promise, the covenant. Uh, it is a s symbolic of the promise that Jesus made to you and to me so that we would be saved through his sacrifice. And fourthly, everybody tracking? Should we go back to the first three? It's about family. Secondly, it's about remembering. You feel like you're in school this morning? I'm sorry if you do, not intentional. It's about the promise, the covenant, all right, of, of, of Christ's blood for us, for you, for me, his body, as a, as a promise. And then finally, fourth, it's about advertising, all right? The word in Scripture that you'll read in your passage is proclaiming but it's about advertising. It's about shouting loudly that we are His children. We are advertising the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're advertising that to each other. We're advertising that to a lost world. So the Lord's Supper is about family. If you feel like saying this with me, just you're just more than welcome. It's about what? Family. It's about remembering. It's about the promise. It's about advertising. Let me do this again. It's about family. It's about remembering. It's about the promise. It's about advertising. Y'all are just amazing. I'm going to put gold stars for you on a panel in the back here. Well done, well done, well done. Family. And so whenever this is done outside of the context of family, uh, it is a horrible example of, of what not to do. So he's writing there and he says this. Uh, we can pop that up again. He says, Therefore, my brethren, when you come to eat together, wait for one another. Do this together. Now what the Corinthians were doing, <laughs> they were having parties. Uh, so they would say, this is the Lord's Supper Day. You know, bring your, bring your beer, bring your alcohol. Uh, they would get drunk at these gatherings. Uh, so says Paul. says, I hear these horrible things about you whenever you get together. And there's people who are hungry who come to these meetings who don't get food. But those of you who have food, don't share your food. And on top of that, you're having parties and you're getting drunk. Saying this is not the point of the Lord's Supper. He says it needs to be done together. Uh, he, says, he says, I have no good things to say about you. Wow. Uh, but that when you come together, it's supposed to be about family. The reality is that in Christ, the barriers are supposed to come down, right? As we become a child of God, all of a sudden we become a new nation. Uh, scripture is just full of these statements of clarity about when we come together under the name of Christ. So we become a child of God. We become a new family, a new nation. It's a big deal. And this new identity, this new identity is a greater identity than the cultures that we came from. And if I didn't get along with you because I didn't like the way you combed your hair. <clears throat> By the way, that's never a problem for me. Um, but in Christ, all of a sudden, we have relationship. And we come together. We are, we are family. Uh, if I had trouble with the color of your skin and you had the trouble with the color of my skin, all of a sudden, that's not important anymore. What's more important is that we are both children of God and we are united. The, the beauty of Christ and beauty of that relationship is that barriers are, 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 are destroyed that are dividing people. This is the power of the gospel. This is the power of Christ is that he unites people who otherwise did not get along. He, he unites enemies uh, to, to a point to where they actually love each other. Uh, this is the miracle of Jesus Christ. And this is the miracle of salvation is that we become family. 
the only way that this world can be united is, is under the, the banner of Jesus Christ. That, that's it. Uh, because Jesus moves us into family. In Christ, the barriers are dropped. The, the walls of separation drop. And God, if we still struggle with racism, we struggle with a, a, a lack of unity, God begins to work on our hearts and to train us and to rebuild us into thinking properly so that we can relate well to others. We, we are transformed in the renewing of our minds and we are converted into family. We are converted into unity. So this begs the question then, who can take the Lord's Supper? Well, the Lord's Supper is for the family of God, for the children of God. Uh, and it's not for those who don't know Christ, who are, who are not part of this family. Uh, it is for those who have professed, who have followed Christ. And, and those who take the Lord's Supper are doing so in remembrance of that relationship of family. It's about family. It, of course, is about remembering. Um, the passage is very clear here. It says, look at this, the next passage. Uh, For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want us to just pause for a moment and and see if we can understand and remember what Jesus did for us. Uh, a lot of us, maybe in, in this room here, wear crucifix. We wear a cross. Anyone wearing crosses this morning? Um, we've, we've cleaned up the cross, have we not? Uh, we've, made a, we've made it gold, sometimes silver. Uh, I don't know what precious metal you're wearing around your neck if you're wearing a cross. But it's that we remember, right, what Jesus Christ did for us. I, I have no problem with beautiful crosses. But... I do want us this morning to remember that the cross was, was really painful. The cross was ugly. Uh, the cross was cruel. And the reality is, is that Jesus was thrown onto this cross and nails, in, enormous nails, were, were nailed through His hands uh, into the cross. Uh, you, you can just imagine how excruciatingly painful this must have been for our Lord and Savior. And it's important that remember, this was a massive sacrifice. It was a painful sacrifice. Before he was crucified on the cross, he was whipped. Uh, he was whipped uh, beyond what was actually legal. Uh, the whipping was uh, of a kind that would tear the flesh off of his body. These whips were not, you know, these cute little whips that you can buy in stores that, you know, pop. Uh, the, these were whips that had uh, sometimes metal, bones, glass, tied into the ends of the leather. And when he was slapped with this cord, uh, the metal, the glass, whatever was tied to the ends would, would pierce uh, his skin. And then when they pulled the, the whip back, it would rip the flesh off the body of our Savior. So Jesus was effectively crucified to the cross, already bleeding, already torn, already shredded because of this brutal, brutal beating that he'd received prior to being crucified. We know before he was even whipped, he was stressed about what he knew was coming. We see him praying with his disciples in the garden and he's agonizing. The Bible tells us that he, he's weeping, he's crying, he's praying, begging his God, his Father, please, if be your will, take this from me. But, but not your will, not my will, but yours be done. He's praying, please, God, if, if it be your will, please, can I avoid this? Can I avoid this? And he was stressed about it. We know he was stressed. The Bible tells us that he sweat, what? Drops of blood. This is a physiological phenomenon called hematidrosis, where under extreme stress, the, the capillaries, as we say here in Namibia, uh, we say capillaries where I come from, but the capillaries, uh, the capillaries actually burst under stress, and this blood actually pours into sweat pores and then pours out. And so he was sweating drops of blood. We see this today in modern life when... At an accident scene or when there's great trauma, you'll see people who actually will sweat blood under extreme, extraordinary trauma. And that's what our Lord and Savior was experiencing and feeling, beginning to feel the weight of our sin, beginning to feel the weight of the sin of humanity, stressed, drops of blood, and he knew what was coming. So he's whipped, he is mocked, he's jeered, 
And then he's crucified on a cross that he carries. He carries this cross to Golgotha. And then he's crucified. Uh, he's a crown of thorns is put on his head. The kind of the kind of thorns we understand in Namibia, big thorns, not tiny little pricks that we have in my part of the world, <laughs> but big thorns that pierce and poison and sting when they go into your head. And this is what our Lord and Savior su suffered for you and for me so that we can have salvation. And then he was pierced with a sword, just trying to check and see if uh, he was dead or not, a uh, sword through his side. Uh, Jesus uh, chose the moment, though, after all the suffering, when he released his spirit. His spirit was released, died, and then he was buried. And then three days later, he rose again. Uh, he overcame death. And so we celebrate the victory over death. We celebrate the victory over the punishment that was our due, that was destined for us. We celebrate that Jesus Christ uh, paid the sin that you and I desperately needed to pay, but did not have to because of the incredible, extraordinary love, compassion, sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. And we need to declare it. It's about covenant. It's about the promise. And we take this realizing that Jesus made a promise to you, and not only a sacrifice, but a promise. Uh, it's clear that blood uh, had to be spilled in order to pay for. There had to be a, a literal sacrifice for our sins. Up to the point of Jesus, uh, prior to that, there was actual animal sacrifices that were sacrificed on altars over and over again to pay for the sins of Israel, pay for all the sins of, of God's people. This happened on a regular basis. It was a, a daily, sometimes weekly, uh, a weekly, sometimes daily uh, event where people brought animals and were sacrificed on the altar where blood was spilled. We know this to be the case. Hebrews 9 says this. Um, Hebrews 9, verse 22 says this. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with what? With blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And let me hop down to verse 27. I'm sorry, verse 28 that says this. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who eagerly are waiting for Him. Hallelujah, right? Uh, blood was spelled. This is, a, this is a, a document, if you will. The blood is this promise that what Christ has done for us is, is sure. Uh, and salvation will be ours. Salvation is ours because of what Christ has done. It's the covenant. It's the covenant of His blood, the promise. And I believe on that fourth point, <laughs> this is about advertising. It's about proclamation. It's about witnessing loudly shouting that Jesus Christ has saved us. And that's why we take this supper. I have, I have asked uh, this morning a friend of mine, uh, Johan, who you've seen up here already, to come and share with you for him to proclaim what Christ is doing in his life. And as he shares with us this morning, uh, you and I need to be pondering uh, our salvation, what Christ has done in our lives. I want to invite him just to come on up. He was brave enough to, to come and share uh, his life before Christ, how he met Christ, and his life after Christ, what Jesus has done for him. So come and listen. Thank you, Brian. I'm a nervous wreck as I stand here. I can guarantee you that. Behind this mic, I'm comfortable. Because I, that's where God put me. This is a different responsibility. Of course, I have to share something that um, I think in today's life, everybody needs to adhere to or listen to. Not just because it's me. Each and every one of you has has testimony of your own, which can change a life out there. I grew up in in Swakop. I was I was born in Walfish Bay. Um, many years ago, we we still lived in a time where you got a hiding when you got home late from the sea. 
playing with the fishes, catching some sardinkis or stuff in the water, coming home late, you get a hiding. But I always cried when I got to the gate and I knew I'm going to get a hiding. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. Um, I grew up in, in, in Swakop all my life, uh, made matric there. The day I put down my pen in my matric exam, I said, this is the last time I will ever study. And that was the last time. I'm not a, I'm not a person that you can put behind books and said, read this book. It takes me a while to read a book. Years, it might be, if I get to the book. Um, grew up in Swakop. I started working there in the police force. And then, um, I don't want to put years to it. It, it, might, it might give away something. Um, I, I, I came to Vinduk. I was in the police force here for four years. And in those four years, a friend of mine one day um, invited me to church. I wasn't, I wasn't a drinker. I was a, sometimes when we go out, we, I, I would drink, but it just take one drink, then I'm done anyway. Always avoid fights, always avoid, avoid aggression. Um, I've seen a lot of that as a child. Um, my parents, I love them dearly. They're still both alive. I'm blessed with that. But I've seen what alcohol has done in my house, the devastation it caused. Um, and in the police force, somebody invited me to church, to a Pentecostal church. So where I grew up, and the Dutch Reformed, I'm going to name it as it is, um, your parents made the decision for you. You have to go to church. That's the right thing to do. You have to take communion. That's the right thing to do. For us, it was a joke. We didn't understand what communion meant as a child. And that morning when I went into that church, I knew, I knew right there and then the void that I, was, that I had in my life was filled that morning because the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of my heart. And change came about. So what do we do when we are asked to change, when God desires for us to change, to be apart from this world, in this world, but apart from this world? Sometimes we fight against it. Sometimes we stand against it. So I journeyed with, I don't know if, if any of you ever remember Pastor Hin and Tani Betsy, two beautiful people. Their son, Hiu, he fasted and prayed for two weeks to play piano. And if you hear him play piano today, you would think he had, a, he had lessons for years to play piano. I saw that with my eyes, him fasting and praying to be able to play the piano. So when I, when I met God that way that morning, I had a desire to do something for him. I had a desire to, to, to go to a direction he wants me to go into. But I didn't know then what it was. I always attended prayer meetings. I always attended music practice, even though I didn't know anything about music. Somewhere along the line, I knew I could sing, but I didn't know. And then one Tuesday, he asked me, don't you want to play the bass? He said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And as I say it, that's how it happened. It was a Tuesday evening. We had band practice. He put the bass around my neck and he played a, a, a C, the key that he learned me on. It was a C, an F and a D. He said, listen to the sound. That was a Tuesday. The Sunday I played in church. That's why still today I cannot read music. I, I listened to the, to the sound. And then I knew God had a plan. So as I journey, when I look back today, I, sorry, I'm jumping around. When I look back today, I understand why people said to me, this day, it's not for us to meet the expectation, expectations of this day. This day is for us to get together so that God can change us. Paul, in many of his letters, write, as a family, we shape each other. If, Isa, if I see a brother or sister 
going a wrong path, I should be at a place to be able to go to that brother or sister and you should be at a place for me to listen to what I'm saying. We should shape each other. But what do we do? We, we avoid it because we don't want to get into arguments with fellow brothers and sisters. So at that point in time, I, I, I started cycling. I, I did triathlon. I did ultra running. Um, pushed my body to a point where, where one day I had, a, I had a little bit of an accent, but I get to that now. So every day, every day, because I lived with a pastor and his, and his family in a, in, in, a, in a flat, they said to me, don't go riding on a Sunday. It's a time for God. It's a time for you to, to go to church. I always rebelled because I want to go cycle. That was my passion. So the journey went on and on and on, and then there's a lot of things happened in that, in that period of time. Um, you grow as, as, as the Word leads you, as the Word lights up your path. You find, you find different things away from this world. And you actually realize that there is a life beyond what the world can give you. Um, so as I journey on this, on, on this path in, in, 20, in 2012, 2011, I was part of Emmanuel Church worship team and a friend of mine, Peter Hearn, is a, a big man. He's quite well known. Those of you that know Peter, he, I didn't know at that site, I saw I saw my Michelle, and I knew this, there's something there. That was at the age of 45. Um, I always said I will never marry an English girl. <laughs> Little to add, two children, both English. So at that point, I asked Peter, but who's that with, with his wife? And he said, that's so-and-so. And, so I saw the girls and I thought, this is my opportunity. I'm going to grab a hold of those girls and get, get to the mother that way. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Um, she didn't understand at that point what does this man have to do with my children. They always brought me cookies from, from children's, children's church. And uh, yeah, two years later, after push and pull, push and pull, I pushed her away because I want to be alone but still want to go to dinner tonight with you. So I want to be away, but I still want to be with her. So it's easier to push her away, having my freedom, but still want to go out with her. It got to a point where, where one day she was on her way to me to tell me, this is, now, this is now done. And the Lord said to her, trust me. On the way to my house, the Lord said to her, trust me. She turned around and went home. In 2012, we got married. A total different journey. Brian talks about family. And in the sport that I do, it requires a lot of time. Time away from the house. Especially when you have, when as a, as a husband and a wife, you don't share the same challenges when it comes to the sport. I don't want to talk about the way I do things and to what extent I do things. But I always knew before I met them, I, God always said to me, you need to be ready for compromise. You need to be ready that there's a big change coming along this path at, at that age. So they walked into my life, we got married and everything changes. Now it's not just about me. Now it's about them, not just my wife, her priority, but also the children. At that point, I was at the, at the bank. I worked at the bank. For, that was my about 23 years down the line. And I realized in the bank, because Sunday, when comes Sunday afternoon, I went into a depression mode because I have to go to work tomorrow. I dreaded every moment of it. 
And I sat her down one day and I said, I, I, cannot, I cannot work in the bank anymore. I cannot come home. The children is right here at the car. I will never forget it for as long as I live. The Kia had running boards. So they, when I stopped at the bottom, I had to reverse in the yard. They jumped on the running boards and they stand right here. And I knew, I mean, I don't want to go into their history. It, was, it wasn't a nice history. Um, and I knew they needed me to be there. And I can't be there right there and then when I work in the bank. So we talked about it. And we decided that I'm going to resign the bank. I had a plan. God put something in my heart. I had a plan to go to do something. And uh, I made a decision. 24 hours almost, I said to them, I can't, I can't live this lie. <laughs> because I tell you, I'm not, I'm not breaking banks down. We, we, we need them. But if you're in that environment, I don't know if you work in the bank. If you can, the words were literally, if you can milk a client to emptiness, milk them to emptiness. My words were straightforward. I can't do that. And then everything turns towards you. When you stand for what is right, expect it to turn against you. Don't be scared of it. God is still there, right next to you. Maybe you sit here this morning and you go to work every day dreading to go to work. Make a choice. Make a choice. For the sake of your health and for the sake of your family. I'm not saying um, stand up and, and protest or strike. Stand up for your rights. Stand up for what is important to you. So I made the choice to resign the bank and, and start a spinning studio. In 2012, we got married. June, so that year I resigned the bank. We did renovations in the first year of marriage. And I, I started a process of about six to seven months where, where we knew we we're going to have to live on her income. And God came through. Eleven years later, the studio is, is running well. I have, I have a platform where I can deal with people every day. And I mean, there, there is one or two people here that has been with me before. This is not just about getting people fit. I trust God every time I walk into the studio for somebody today that needs to hear something. Because people come to spinning to get ready for the day or they come out of the day into spinning to get rid of the day. That's literally what I see on a daily basis. People are broken to the bone for the sake of their job. And I'm asking the, the question, is that what God wants us to do? Is that where God wants us to be? As a husband, as a mother. We have to, we have to at some point in our lives make a choice for what is right. For the sake of your marriage, for the sake of your children, and walk the way God wants us to walk according to His Word. The world today approve of many things which is against God's Word. And He calls us not to conform to the patterns of this world, but to stand for what is right in His eyes. We, we are sitting at the table and I don't know, I don't know if you, I mean, many of you probably have seen the movie Passion. Um, there was a lot of hoo-hahs about it, but I, I want to say to you that's the closest to the truth that you can get when it comes to what Jesus experienced on that day. And you know what? He didn't have to do it. He didn't have to do it. But because of love, love that our human, human minds cannot even try 
to think about. The Father sent Jesus to this world knowing what's going to happen to him. But what was the main thing Jesus did as he walked towards the cross? He loved people. He cared for people. He did good to people. And what does God's words call us to do? James 2. James is a, a book that, that will tell you as it is. There's no hiding from it, and that's the way it should be. He calls us that faith without good deeds is dead. Each and every one of us, as we sit here, know about somebody right now that is going through difficulty. Physically, I cannot, and I say it with the utmost respect, I cannot even think what a person that's dealing with cancer, and I have people in my spinning that spins with me that I know have cancer. I cannot tell you I know how it feels. I cannot. But I can be there to give you a hug. I can be there to listen as do each one of us. I cannot tell a person that's going through emotional difficulty, which I have a lot of people in my spinning again, I cannot tell you how it is, but I can be there to hug you, to listen. Where we can make a difference is when we are able to, when we know about somebody going through difficulty financially, with food, with clothes, in whatever way, it might mean a little less in my pocket, but it might mean something from an empty house to somebody else. If we can walk out that door today and take what Jesus has done for us and do good to this world, we will become the trustworthy source again that God wants us to be. Where people can run to, being a lighthouse, each one of us. Where people can run to and know I can trust you with what I'm about to tell you. I want to leave that with you today. This question. Jesus died for our sins. If we approve of everything that is against this world, if we approve... I'm going to say it as it is. We approve of alcohol. We approve of smoking. We approve of homosexuality. What did Jesus die for? What sin did he die for? The sin that is comfortable for me to leave? To get rid of? Or did he die for everything? Jesus doesn't do halfway. He did a full job. We need to deal with the hurt that we carry with inside of us. And the only way we, can, way we can do it is to come to God's house, where his people are, and give to people, listen, I need help. Help me. We have an opportunity still to make a huge difference in life. There's need out there. It's difficult out there. But each one of us can be a lighthouse for people to run to and find safety. Sometimes just to be quiet and listen. Sometimes just for a hug. Sometimes just to be noticed. Sometimes to physically take out your wallet and sit and listen. This is all I have, but take it. I know it will make a difference today to you. Come on church, let's be a difference out there. For us as a family, we have journeyed in a few years where we were unhappy where we were. But I can tell you today what I've seen in the past two weeks, three weeks, what, what I've journeyed through again in 10 years' time with a back operation. This is, this is a family that I want to be part of. Why? Because they pray. They pray. Thank you, Brian.